Quasi-Hereditary Algebras, Lecture 10, Problem Session. Problem 1. Let A be a finite dimensional algebra and L1, L2, and so on, LK, a complete list of simple A modules. Assume that the following condition is satisfied. If the first extension from Li to Lj is non-zero, then I is smaller than J. The algebras satisfying this condition are called directed. Proof that A is a quasi-hereditary algebra with respect to this order, which we fixed on simples and with simple standard modules. Solution. We start by trying to construct standard modules. Consider the indecomposable projective module PI, and let us look closer at the condition that the first extension from Li to Lj is non-zero implies that I is smaller than J. This condition means that all arrows in the Gabriel quiver of A are directed from the vertices with smaller indices to the vertices with bigger indices. Indeed, the arrows in the Gabriel quiver of A, they correspond exactly to a choice of a basis in this vector space of first extensions between simple modules. And if these first extensions are non-zero, only if i is smaller than j, then we only have arrows from smaller vertices i to larger vertices j. Okay, but then this means that all simple subquotients of the radical of our indecomposable projective pi have the form lj, where j is strictly greater than i. And this now implies that the trace of pi plus 1, pi plus 2, and so on up to pk in our module pi equals the radical of pi, because this radical consists of simple tops of these modules from which we take the trace. This means that delta i is equal to pi modulo the radical, which means that this is isomorphic to l i. And of course, clearly l i has multiplicity 1 in delta i. Also, the radical of pi, this is the kernel of the projection from pi onto delta i, it is filtered by simples lj, where j is greater than i. But these simples are also standard modules, delta j, where j is greater than i, so this kernel of the projection from pi onto delta i has a standard filtration. And this means exactly that our algebra A is quasi-hereditary for this order. Problem 2. Let A be a finite dimensional algebra and L1, L2, and so on, Lk, a complete list of simple A modules. Assume that this algebra satisfies the following condition. X1 from Li to Lj is non-zero implies that I is greater than J, so that the opposite inequality compared to the inequality in the previous problem. Such algebras are also called directed, and it is a little bit confusing both algebras in the first problem and in the second problem are called directed. Proof that A is quasi-hereditary with respect to this order and that the corresponding standard modules are projective. Solution. Again, let us start by trying to construct standard A modules. Consider the indecomposable projective module PI. Now, if you look at the conditions and x1 li to lj non-zero implies that i is greater than j, this means that all arrows in the Gabriel quiver of A are directed from the vertices with bigger indices to the vertices with smaller indices. And therefore, all simple subquotients of the radical of pi have the form lj, where now j is strictly smaller than i. And this means that the trace of pi plus 1 plus and so on plus pk in pi is zero, because pi doesn't have any li plus 1, any li plus 2, and so on. And this means that delta i is equal to pi modulo zero, which is pi. So our deltas are indeed projected. Again, the multiplicity of li in delta i is 1. And as we have seen, the kernel of the projection from pi to delta i is zero. And of course, zero is filtered by whatever we wish. So this kernel is trivially filtered by delta j for j is greater than i. The filtration is trivial. And this means exactly that our algebra is indeed quasi-hereditary and it has projective standard modules. 
This completes problem two. Problem three. Let Q be a finite acyclic quiver. Let Q overlined be the quiver obtained from Q by adding the opposite arrow alpha op for every arrow alpha in Q. So as soon as we have an arrow alpha from I to J in Q, we add an arrow alpha op from J to I into the opposite direction to form Q bar. So Q overline consists of all arrows in Q and all opposites of those arrows. Now let A be the quotient of the pass algebra of Q overlined by the relation beta times alpha op is equal to zero for all arrows alpha and beta in Q, for which the relation makes sense. So if we can compose beta after alpha op, then this composition must be zero in our quotient of the pass algebra. Proof that our algebra A is a finite dimensional quasi-hereditary algebra with a simple preserving duality and describe its standard modules. Solution. Let us start by showing that A is finite dimension. Indeed, all relations which we have are homogeneous of degree two, so they belong to the square of the arrow idea. That's good. We want to prove that our algebra A is a quotient of the path algebra of a quiver by some admissible idea. An ideal is admissible if it belongs to the square of the arrow ideal and if it contains some power of the arrow ideal. We have just shown that our ideal belongs to the square of the arrow ideal. That's good. Now, let's try to prove that our ideal contains some power of the arrow ideal. Since our quiver Q was assumed to be acyclic, the opposite quiver is also acyclic, and in particular, if we have a finite acyclic quiver, the length of the path is, of course, bounded. Now, if we take a long enough path in Q overlined, then this path should contain both some paths in the quiver Q and some paths in the opposite quiver. Moreover, they should mix. So, In particular, if the length is long enough, we necessarily will have some arrows from Q staying to the left of some arrows in the opposite quiver. And this exactly hits our relation. And this means that all long enough passes in Q overline belong to our ideal, and so our ideal is admissible, which means that our algebra A is finite dimension. Next, let us argue that A has a simple preserving duality. For this, it is enough to show that the algebra A as an anti-automorphism that fixes the trivial passes at all vertices. And this anti-automorphism can be defined by sending each arrow alpha to its opposite. Sending alpha to alpha opposite clearly gives an anti-automorphism of Q overlined, which fixes the vertices, and hence it gives an anti-automorphism of the path algebra of Q overlined. And this anti-automorphism of the path algebra induces an anti-automorphism of A because the set of all relations is invariant under it. So if we take a relation of the form beta alpha op and apply to it our anti-automorphism, we will get the opposite of alpha op times beta op. Alpha of op is alpha, so we will get alpha times beta op and this is again a relation. It's not the same relation as we started with, but it is some relation. So the set of all our relations is invariant with respect to our anti-automorphism of the path algebra. And so this anti-automorphism induces the anti-automorphism on the quotient of the path algebra module of the ideal generated by these relations. Next, let us choose a linear order on the vertices of Q. We choose some ordering v1, v2, and so on vn on the vertices of Q, such that existence of an arrow from vi to vj implies that j is greater than i. So we order the vertices such that all arrows go into one direction, increase the vertices, and this is possible because Q is acyclic. This was our assumption. And we are going to prove that our algebra A is quasi-hereditary for this order. So for this, let us determine the standard modules. 
Consider the indecomposable projective PI for some vertex I. The indecomposable projective module for a path algebra consists of all paths which start at the vertex I. So let us consider the projection of PI onto delta I, where delta I is a standard module defined for our order. So the kernel of this projection is generated by the trace of PI plus 1, PI plus 2, and so on in PI. And this trace is exactly the value of our projective module PI at all vertices J, which are greater than I. Therefore, any non-zero arrow in delta I that starts at I must go to a smaller vertex, because all bigger vertices will be killed when we project PI onto delta I. And the arrows which go from I to smaller vertices are exactly arrows of the form A op. Therefore, any non-zero error in delta I that starts at I must go to a smaller vertex because all high vertices have the value zero in the projection from PI to delta I. And the arrows which go to smaller vertices are exactly the arrows of the form alpha op. After we used some alpha op, it is not allowed to use any beta from Q because of the relation that beta times alpha op is zero. So this means that we can compose those alpha op arrows only with other alpha op arrows, which means that the only arrows in Q overlined, which are non-zero in delta I, are the arrows of the form alpha op. And our relations do not put any restrictions on the composition of the alpha op arrows at all. And this means that the restriction of delta I to the opposite quiver of Q gives exactly the indecomposable projective module at the vertex i for this quiver. It remains to prove that projective A modules have a standard filtration. So we can do this by induction on the number of vertices in Q. The basis of the induction, if Q has one vertex, it has no arrows, and so our algebra A is K, and there is nothing to prove. For the induction step, we need to show that the trace of the very last projective Pn in any projective module PI is a projective A module. Assume that we are given some pass omega from I to N in Q. So some pass omega from I to N, this corresponds exactly to the situation when we have some simple subquotient of the form LN in PI, and this simple subquotient gives us some homomorphism from PN to PI, and we need to look what happens with the image of this homomorphism, because when we add up, maybe not directly, all such images, we will get the trace of Pn in Pi. Okay, so assume that we have a path omega from i to n in Q. Note that n is greater than i, great, which means that this path can only be formed by the arrows in Q. And then our relations allow to add to this path any arrows from Q op. So we are now at the maximal point. There are no arrows in Q which you can apply, but now you can apply any arrow from Q op to the left of the arrows in Q. And all this never hits any relations. And this means exactly that the homomorphism from Pn to Pi, which sends the generator of Pn to omega, is injective. Because Pn, we already showed, that Pn is a projective module over the opposite algebra. And this completes our proof. This means that the trace of Pn and Pi will be a projective module, and this means that by induction, any projective module has a delta filtration. This completes problem three. Problem four. Let Pt2 be the monoid of all partial transformations on one and two. Compute the quiver and relations for the basic algebra, which is Morita equivalent to the monoid algebra of this monoid over the complex numbers, and use this to show that this monoid algebra is quasi-hereditary. Solution. The monoid PT2 has the following nine elements. We have the identity element, the transposition of two and one, the constant map which maps one and two to one, the constant map which maps 1 and 2 to 2, the map which is defined on 1 and maps 1 to 1, 
the map which is defined on one and maps one to two, the map which is defined on two and maps two to one, the map which is defined on two and maps two to two, and the map which is not defined anywhere. So the domain of this map is the empty set. So these are the nine elements of PT2. Now we can arrange them into the two-sided equivalence classes with respect to the Green's two-sided relation, J. We will have on top the equivalence class J2, which contains the identity element. So these are elements whose range consists of two elements. They have rank two. So J2 consists of the identity and of the transposition of one and two. Then we have the class J1, which consists of all elements whose range has one element, so the rank one. So here we have the constant elements which map everything to one or to two, and the elements defined on either one or two, and with the range one on two. So this two-sided class can be split into three left classes and two right classes. So we have the left class, which consists of both constant maps, the left class, which consists of the two elements which are defined on one, and the left class, which is, consists of the two elements which are defined at two. And we have the right class, such that the range of these elements in this class is one, and we have the right class of the three elements whose range is two. And finally, we have the two-sided class of the elements of rank zero, which consists of the zero element of this monoid, which is the map which is not defined anywhere. Now we have three J classes. They all are regular because J2 has identity, that's an idempotent. J1 has this constant map is an idempotent clearly, and J0 just consists of one idempotent. So all these classes are regular. The maximal subgroups inside these two-sided classes are the symmetric groups. So the maximal subgroup for Ji is the symmetric group Si. Indeed, so here we have just the symmetric group S0 on one element, here we have the symmetric group S1 on one element, and here we have the symmetric group S2 on two elements. And this means that we have the following four simple modules for our monoid. The module L empty set, which corresponds to the empty partition of zero. The module L1, which corresponds to the partition one of one. The module L2, which corresponds to the partition two of two and the module L11, which corresponds to the partition 1, 1 of 2. So L empty set, that's a simple module for S0, L1 is a simple module for S1, and L2 and L11 are simple modules for S2. The modules L2 and L11 are just the modules over S2 killed by all non-invertible elements, so they have dimension 1, because it's a trivial and the sign S2 modules. These two are one-dimensional. The module L empty set is just the trivial module over the whole monoid, so it, it is also one-dimensional. So the only unclear thing, what is the dimension of L1? So let's look at L1. L1 is a simple top of the left cell module, which corresponds to the left cell, consisting of the two constant maps. If we apply to these elements, the map which sends one to one and two to empty, then the first element will go to itself because one goes to one, and the second element will go to zero because the composition of one, two, 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 and one, one, two, undefined is a totally undefined element which has smaller rank. So the action of this element on to the constant element with range two is zero. At the same time, if you look at the element which sends one to the empty set and two to two, so this sends the first basis element in our module to zero, while the second basis element to itself. So this means that the kernels of these two elements are linearly independent, which means that this module, the cell module, which is two dimensional, it does not have any one-dimensional submodule, so it is a simple module over our monoid algebra. So it must coincide with L1. In other words, this means that our two-dimensional cell module 
on our left cell is simple, and so our L1 has dimension 2. If a simple module has dimension 2, this means that the corresponding projective module appears with multiplicity 2 in the regular module. So now let us look at the regular module. It, of course, has a filtration by left cell modules, and we saw this filtration. Here are the left cells. Here we have our module L empty set, the trivial module, so it's just one left cell. So for J2, we have the simple module L2 and the simple module L11. Together, they give us the left cell module for J2. For J1, we have three left cells, each with two elements. So each contributes with one copy of L1. So two of these will contribute to P1. And we have one copy of L1 left, which should go to some other projective module, which should be a submodule or subquotient of some other projective module. Let's find out in which. So let's repeat. The left cell J0 gives us the simple module L, the empty set which is also projective because uh, it's just the cell module and that's the maximal left cell. The left cell J1 gives us L2 and L11. And the three left cells in G1 give us one copy of L1 each. This means that the module L1 has multiplicity 3 in the regular module. Now let us look at projectives. The projective P empty set is just the left cell module for the left cell J0. So it is simple because it's one dimension. The projective P1, so if we start from our left cell containing the constant elements and apply all elements in our group, we will get that left cell L together with J0. So P1 should be a summand of the linearization of L and J0. But the linearization of J0 splits off the projective P empty set. And this means that the projective at 1 is just the linearization of L, and we saw that that's a simple module. So P1 is equal to L1. P1 appears with multiplicity 2, so we have one copy of L1 left, and this extra copy of L1 should be a subquotient of either P2 or P11. To determine which one is the correct one, we look at the right cell modules. So we consider the right cell consisting of all elements with range 1. So that's a constant map which sends everything to 1, the map which is defined at 1 and sends 1 to 1, and the map which is defined at 2 and sends 2 to 1. So we have the corresponding right cell module, that's a right module over our monoid algebra, and it has dimension 3 because the cell has 3 elements. And we know that our module L1 has dimension 2. And it is easy to check that the right cell module for this right cell has a one-dimensional submodule, which is generated by the following element. We take the constant map, mapping everything to 1, subtract the map which is defined at 1 and sends it to 1, and we also subtract the map which is defined at 2 and send it to 1. If we operate by the symmetric group S2 on the right of this module, it sends this element to itself and it swaps these two elements. So the whole linear combination doesn't change. So this means that the module which is generated by this element as a right S2 module is the trivial module, which means that L1 is a subquotient of the projective module which corresponds to the trivial S2 module L2. So it's a subquotient of the projective module P2. And now we can draw the quiver of the basic algebra, which is Morita equivalent to our monoid algebra. We have four vertices which correspond to our simple modules, so the partitions 1, 1, 2, 1, and the empty set. And since L1 is a subquotient of P2, we have an arrow from 2 to 1. And there is nothing else. There are no relations here because there are no compositions of anything. We just have one arrow. So this algebra is hereditary and hence also quasi-hereditary. And this completes problem four. Some extra problems and questions at the end. Problem question one. 
determine all cost standard modules and also both the category of modules filtered by standard modules and the category of modules filtered by cost standard modules for algebras in problem one. Problem question two, exactly the same question, but for algebras in problem two. Problem question three, determine all cost standard modules for algebras in problem three. Problem question four, Generalize problem C to the case when we glue two algebras which are directed into opposite directions. In problem three, we started from a quiver algebra for an acyclic quiver and added to it a quiver algebra for the opposite quiver. We can generalize it by taking two arbitrary algebras which are directed, as in problems one and two, in opposite directions and glue them together. So that's the content of the problem question four. And problem question five, question how to solve the last part of problem four without using right modules. Thank you very much and see you next time.